Welcome, everybody, this morning. We're so glad that you've come to join us for worship this morning at a New Heights Praise and Worship Service here at Pulaski Heights UMC, especially if you are a visitor. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Um, just a couple of things. Hopefully everyone got a bulletin as you came in. There are two really important things to this bulletin. The first is that it has the Connect card on there. One thing that does is you register your attendance. It's just, it helps us to know that you're here and who you are so that we can celebrate being in worship with you. On the back of that, there are also several ways for you to get plugged in in the life of the church, several events that are going on that we hope you'll find something that you're interested in to sign up for. Um, it also has places for you to take notes during the sermon today, which is always really helpful. Um, and then you'll have the opportunity here later in the service to tear off that portion of the Connect card and put it in the offering plate this morning. Two very important things that are coming up that we want to mention to you is that the first is uh, this evening in the Great Hall and throughout the building, we will be having our Halloween Carnival um, from 3 to 5.30. Um, this is one of my favorite events of the year. One, just because it's really fun, but two, it's one of the awesome ways that our church comes together as an entire community. Um, the youth will be throwing a spooky haunted house upstairs. Um, our adult Sunday school classes will be providing some really fun 
fun games in the gym. Um, and so this is just a way that as a church family, we can all come together um, and have a lot of fun. So we hope that you can come today for that. Um, the second is that next weekend is Touch of Class. Um, every other year, the music ministries of this church put on an incredible weekend of performances. Um, tickets are available for that. So we hope if you don't have one already, um, that you will buy a ticket for Touch of Class. I don't know about you guys, but I often sometimes have trouble knowing the words to say when I'm praying. Sometimes it's really easy. We come to God and we have something specific that's on our heart, and so we know those words. And then other times it's really hard just to know what to say. Uh, when I find myself in those times, I always turn to the Psalms. Um, they have some beautiful prayers, um, prayers that have been written by other people that still speak to us and touch our hearts and the things that we're going through. So for our opening prayer this morning, I'd like for us to all be in an attitude of prayer together as I read from the Psalms. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When we consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. I'd like to invite the children, to, the rest of the children, to come forward now for our lesson for young Christians this morning. Awesome to have all of you guys up here today. I want you guys to look at this picture that's going to go up on the screen. It's a picture of a drop of water, and it creates a ripple. Have you guys ever seen that? When you drop something, maybe a stone, or when it's raining into a puddle of water, it makes all these little ripples. There's something really cool about these ripples. Did you know that every single one is exactly the same distance apart? Isn't that kind of cool? So all it takes is that one little drop and all of these circles go out and everyone gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I just think that's really cool. And what we're going to be talking about in our sermons for the next couple of weeks are how as disciples, as followers of Jesus, we have that same effect on the world around us. If you think of us as that little drop and the whole world as the puddle, when we go out into the world and the ways that we live our lives and the things that we do when we're nice to people and when we, when we do helpful things and we say nice things to people, those actions that we take have a ripple effect. And it, all it takes is one person to make a huge difference in the world. But these ripples remind me of something else. Have any of you guys ever looked at the inside of a tree? Have you seen all the rings in the tree? Do you know what each ring means? A year! So you can count the rings on the inside of the tree and it can tell you how old the tree is. It reminds me of that too, because all it takes is that one little spot in the beginning, that beginning of the life of the tree, and as the tree gets older, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and grows taller. And it made me think about that too, because us and you guys as little kids, we're at the beginning and our tree is pretty small still. Because we're pretty small still, right? But as we get older and as we continue to live as disciples and followers of Jesus, we get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the people that we can influence just, they, there's so much more of them, and there's so many opportunities for us to share the love of God with others. So that's a pretty cool image when you look at those ripples to think about how we can make an impact, make a difference in the world sharing God's love with others. Will you guys pray with me? 
dear God, how cool it is that even nature shows us about how to live in your love. Thank you for using us as your disciples in ways far beyond what we can ever imagine. Help us as your disciples to share your love with everyone that we meet so that we can truly make a difference in the world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I think the choir is going to stay up. You guys are going to sing, right? The choir is going to sing. Everybody else, y'all can go back to your seats. Thanks for coming up today.
Thank you, children. If you are the parent of one of these precious children, would you please stand so they can find you and come sit with you? privilege as a youth ministry this morning of taking just a couple of minutes to share with you um, some of the stories of the ways that lives are being transformed um, through our young people at this church. Um, it's my belief, and not just because I work here, that this church has one of the best youth ministry programs in the entire state. Um, I was thinking, trying to figure out one word to sum up what we believe is happening in the youth group at this church, and the word that kept running through my mind is hungry. Our youth are hungry to know the Word of God, studying the scriptures. Our youth are hungry to be in fellowship and relationship with each other. Our youth are hungry to learn what it means to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, but instead of me telling you about what's going on in the life of this church and the way that God is changing lives, um, I wanted to invite a couple of our youth to tell you for themselves. So I'd like to invite Miller and Julianne to come forward at this time to share with you about um, the ways that the Lord is working through them. Hi, everyone. I'm Miller Wilburn, and I'm a 10th grader and a member of PH Youth. This is the start of my fifth year here, and let me tell you, I cannot get enough. I'm getting fed spiritually by two awesome youth pastors, Jay Clark and Katie Dunn. I'm enjoying fellowship with all the youth where I can have fun in a safe and welcoming atmosphere. It's amazing all the opportunities that I've been given to grow in faith. There's Veritas, Youth 2011, cross training on Tuesday nights, and youth on Sunday nights, just to name a few. It's at these times that I grow close to God and study his word in the Bible. At other times, I've been blessed with experiences like Ozark Mission Project, Local Mission Week, and the prison ministry with Mr. Faulkner, where I get to reach out to love and serve the world as Jesus commanded. PH Youth has shaped me as a disciple of Jesus Christ and equipped me to be a representative of our church as well as our God. Truly, I owe my relationship with God to this wonderful community of faith called PH Youth. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julian Daniel. I am a ninth grader at Central High, and I am a member of the PH Youth. I'm involved in the church through youth group and Bible study, and also going on the trips with you, um, like Refuge and Veritas. 
Ever since I became a member, God has been working through me. But that didn't start till I come back from refuge. Refuge made me on fire for God and wanted me to start getting involved in the church by going to youth every Sunday and going to girls' Bible study. Refuge made me realize that I wasn't happy without God, which I thought I was. It also made me realize that I was just one of those people who said, oh, I'm Christian, I go to church every Sunday, I know God, but I really didn't. Refuge made me want to go to church, want to go to youth, and enjoy praying every night, and start really learning about God, and to find what he wants me to do in my life. Thank you. It's not just as a part of a youth group or another group at the church or a Bible study or coming to worship. Our call as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, is to all come to that place of hunger and a deep desire to know Christ. Um, today we are beginning in our church our new uh, capital campaign for 20, or our budget campaign for 2012, which we're calling the Ripple Effect. Um, as you heard earlier, um, our hope is that we can come as a congregation, as a community, to understand that when we give to the church through our money or our time, um, that that goes so far beyond the ways that we can visibly see. You know, when, when we give money that goes toward mission trips, it not only affects the people who go on that trip, but the, the people in the community that they're sent to. There are so many ways, so many avenues that we can give to the church. And it goes so far beyond what we can ever see. That's the power of Jesus Christ at work in the world. And so we're excited about this time, and we hope that you are too. Um, this, um, we've been talking a lot lately about this being the 100th birthday of the church um, coming up in 2012. So um, this is one of our most special campaigns because we are contributing financially um, to our 100th birthday. Um, not only looking at where the church has been and celebrating the ways that we've worked together in the past, but more importantly, looking forward into the future and the ways that we as a community of faith today can continue to strengthen and build the church. Um, they gave me a rough little script for what I was supposed to say, but there was one thing in here that I do want to read to you verbatim because I don't want to get it wrong because it's really good. From the moment we are born, the church is here for us, a sanctuary for worship, a community for prayer, a mission-sending station, and a haven for our children and youth. The church baptizes us, marries us, buries us, and in between offers sustenance for the journey. I've been comforted at every part in my life and hearing the stories of, of you, the members of this church, at the, ways, at, at the many ways in which this church has been a haven, a place to come and find rest and solace in God as we go throughout this lifelong journey that is being a Christian. Um, so we have a video for you this morning uh, from our chairs uh, of, our, of our campaign um, that tells you a little bit more about um, the campaign this year and encourages you to get involved in that. Um, and I think that's ready to go, so please enjoy this video. five years that we've been here, I have really enjoyed um, the seeing the involvement of the caring ministries in our community. Um, I'm involved in different volunteer organizations, and I so often run across members of our church, uh, for example, at UAMS, in working with patients, and I know that they have received their tools, their training. Um, their empathy, their skills right here in our caring ministries, um, which Dr. Reverend Hampton has done a wonderful job with so many of our um, ministries from Cancer Friends, Stephen Ministries, Helping Hands, and, um, but you see these people time and again in the community and they truly, truly are the work of Christ, hands and feet. Uh, for me, I see the ripples um, with our own family, but they're outside of Little Rock. Um, from being uh, from our son watching services when he was in college and um, out of Little Rock, and our daughter living in Dallas, our grandchildren, they can actually 
see events from our website and um, so even though they go far away they're still close to home when they're with our own family but they're still great distances. You know, I think one of the things that maybe surprised me but also gave me a little bit of encouragement when we started looking at this opportunity to be chairs for the stewardship campaign was in the fact that we have 18 percent of our congregation giving, I'm sorry, 17% of our congregation, our families giving to make up 80% of our operating budget. Quite frankly, to me, that is a real opportunity to encourage other families to give and maybe to give more from a, uh, a true spiritual and also a, a commitment level Sunday. And there's still such a warm feeling to be able to give as the senior pastor as Brett asked for funds and to share the gifts that you've been given, there's a warm feeling in putting that back in, into the plate and letting the congregation commit and do that together. So that's a, a good way to give. But I will tell you, as we get more into the techie groups, the online giving, you know, the ACH debits and all the different banking methods that are available to give are certainly ways that younger families are committing and giving to the church. And actually, you may not know it, but you do yours online also. <laughs> Good point. <laughs>
Good morning. I'm Brett Scarter, your senior pastor, and I just ran into the place, and what a great crowd. It's good to see all of you today, and I pray that we'll all be blessed as we worship here at our New Heights service today. Will you pause and, and join me with prayer? Holy God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for your church. We give thanks for your movement within the church. Be with us in this great place as we continue to move forward for you, as we create a wave of love in the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. On December 26, 2004, as the world was quietly commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ, unseen forces deep beneath surface of the Indian Ocean, forces that had been at work for thousands of years, long before the birth of Jesus, suddenly exploded with the power of 23,000 Hiroshima-type bombs. The tectonic plates on the ocean floor shifted, and a 600-mile-long rift appeared along the ocean floor. And, and while this rift was only about 10 yards wide and displaced very little water, nevertheless, it created a massive ripple effect. Sailors at sea barely noticed anything that day. But as that ripple moved from its epicenter closer and closer to the coastline, it gained in force and strength. And that ripple became a wave. And that wave became a very large wave. And that very large wave became a tsunami 50 feet high. And so by the end of the day, on December 26, 2004, by the end of that day, that wave, that tsunami had traveled 3,000 miles, hit 11, 11 countries, 
from the continent of Africa to Thailand and destroyed, destroyed more than 283,000 human lives. A wave is nothing to scoff at. A wave is nothing to scoff at. My family and I experienced something of the power of a wave the, the following summer, 2005, along the Gulf Coast. You may recall that, that in July of 2005, Tropical Cindy formed off the Gulf Coast, becoming Hurricane Cindy. And, and once that hurricane came through, it was almost immediately followed by Hurricane Dennis. And then shortly after, in August, came the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Remember? It, it was during that time that my family and I were forced to evacuate the beach house where we were vacationing at the time. We, we packed up quickly. We loaded our luggage in the car. We eased out of the driveway, made our way through heavy traffic out toward the, the evacuation route on the interstate. We finally edged onto the on-ramp. We were headed that way in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic as far as the eye could see. It, 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 it sat forever. It, it would move in, in spurts. And, and, and we found ourselves opening the windows, turning off the air conditioner, trying to conserve our fuel supply, which was rapidly diminishing. Finally, we had to take an off-ramp. We had to go th to a gas station, and that took another two hours simply to get fuel to continue the journey. By the end of that day, by the end of that day, it took us 14 hours to travel a mere 200 miles from Destin, Florida to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And in that experience, I was amazed at the power of a storm surge or a wave to literally move and displace tens of thousands of people from one point to another. Now, if we're going to talk about uh, the early Christian church, the growth, the birth, the growth, the development, the movement of the church, we have to describe it in this way, as a tiny ripple that became a growing wave and a tsunami that swept over the world and is still sweeping over the world today. In the life, death, and resurrection uh, of Jesus, the tectonic plates of human history shifted in a dramatic and a radical way. Past, present, future came together. Life, death, heaven, hell, human, divine. In this one remarkable moment to change the world forever. And that tsunami continues. If you really want to understand the church and its birth and its movement, the best place to look is the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles, because it really is that dramatic adventure story telling about the, the birth and the growth of the early church. I mean, virtually every page is filled with a new story, one, one that is not so familiar, but one that is, is very expressive of this movement is found in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Let me share with you again the first four verses of Acts 17. After Paul and Silas had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days argued with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This is the Messiah Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and, and not a few of the leading women. Not a few of the leading women. Wherever the disciples carried this good news, this gospel, ripples occurred, and, and, and tidal waves were formed. I mean, here in Thessalonica, chaos erupts. We're told that Paul preached on three consecutive Sabbaths. That means he preached three consecutive weeks on the Sabbath day. He was in Thessalonica with Silas three weeks. He preached the gospel, and we're told people responded. Some members of the synagogue, but also devout Gentiles, those who were not welcomed into the faith at that time. And, and not only Gentiles, but women 
leading women in the community were even converted to this faith. The, uh, the religious establishment, those who kind of want to keep everything here all the time, you know, tame, we know what's coming next, we know what's in the order of worship, they were not happy at all. In fact, they were enraged, and their response is recorded in such a wonderful way in verse 6, chapter 17. The religious authorities, the Pharisees, the scribes said, these people, these Christians, these people have been turning the world upside down, have now come here. I love this. These people who have been turning the world upside down, they've come here to our town. They ran it and they raved. They even followed Paul and Silas to the next city, to Berea, and stirred up trouble there. But they could not kill the movement. They could not kill the movement because this wave was of God. And this wave continued to grow and escalate. And it went out to the entire world, to Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and Cappadocia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. It went to Rome. It, it went beyond. We're told that somehow in this movement, Christianity, which was born as a sect within Judaism, a sect that believed that the Messiah had come in Jesus Christ, this sect somehow broke loose and went out into the world. We find a Roman centurion, a Roman officer, being transformed and changed. We find an Ethiopian eunuch, one who was not accepted in the religious community at all, being received and changed and transformed and becoming a part of the church. You see, with this Jesus wave, the good news was spread. That salvation is no longer just for this group or that group. Salvation is for all, and God loves all, and everyone is eligible for the kingdom. You know, the people you and I may dislike, the people we really don't want in our religious establishment, these are the people God wants most. God loves them most and welcomes them in. Karen and I uh, experienced a little bit of that that historical wave this past spring when we uh, traveled to Italy. We, uh, we found ourselves starting out on the southern coast along Amalfi, and, and in Amalfi we went into the cathedral, and there we, we went to the altar, and there before the altar we, uh, we discovered that the, the relics, the remains, some of the bones of the Apostle Andrew who had taken the gospel into the world, including modern-day Russia, some of Andrew's relics were there beneath the altar. As we moved north through Naples and we approached the city of Rome, we, we came to the Cathedral of St. Paul. It's called St. Paul's Outside the Walls because it's outside the old historical walled city of Rome. And at St. Paul's Cathedral, there we stood before the altar where the beheaded body, the relics of the Apostle Paul, are buried. We even saw the chains that had held Paul and Silas in prison. As we continued our, our run and we went into Rome and we went beyond Rome, we, we went into Vatican City, we walked up the front steps of St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church on the planet. We walked that long nave and approached that massive altar. And there beneath it were the relics, the remains of St. Peter. You see, the, uh, the, the church was never meant to be stagnant tepid, sedentary water. Christ calls the church to be living water, moving water, a ripple, a wave, a tsunami that continues to take over and overwhelm the world with God's love. I mean, quite frankly, if our tectonic plates are not moving in the church today, then, then there's something wrong with us. We're dying. In 2006, Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church inaugurated a, a bold mission endeavor. The mission arm uh, uh, created Miles for Mission. It was a 5K run that would, would provide ministries, money for outreach here at Pulaski Heights. It was exciting. It was dynamic. It changed lives. People were involved. It was, it was fast-moving. It was exciting. But over the last several years, some of the excitement had begun to die down. 
things were slowing a bit. There was not the passion. There was not the excitement. There were not the numbers involved. The, the money began to go down. It's okay. It's part of the life cycle of any organism. But then it happened. A new wave surge occurred. A new wave appeared. And, and, and Miles for Mission was suddenly rebranded Run for Shelter with the goal of, of helping the homeless in the greater Little Rock area. It was marketed not only to our faith community, but to the neighborhood, to the city, and even to the state. And oh my, mission accomplished. It created a tsunami. This year, Run for Shelter raised twice as much money with twice as many runners as it had the previous year. Now, I have to tell you, I've, I've run the last two years. Last year, I ran Miles for Mission, and I'm not ashamed to tell you that I got a trophy. I, I was... I actually came in first place in my age category. It was not the 20 to 30 group, but uh, I came in first place. Um, and I was excited this year. I trained. And in fact, at Run for Shelter, I actually shaved a few seconds from my time the previous year at Miles for Mission. But I didn't win anything this year. As a matter of fact, and I'm embarrassed to tell you, my best time was a full two minutes shorter than the third place winner. What happened in one year? It was a wave. It was a tsunami. It was all these Jews and Greeks we invited to be in the race. It was those, it was those hillcrest dwellers. Those downtown urbanites, those West Little Rock suburbanites. I mean, I even met a couple from Virginia. For God's sake, who invited them to run in my race? It's the reason I didn't win anything. And I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be happier. Because isn't the purpose of the church to create a ripple of love that forms into a wave? and is transformed into a tsunami of God's grace and love for all people. The religious order of Jesus' day did not like Jesus. I don't know if you know that. They did not like him at all. He was stirring things up. Things were changing around the synagogue. He preached this, this new message of, of God's love for all. It, was, it did not set well with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, 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 the council. They didn't like it at all. And so they wanted to silence Jesus. They wanted to shut him up. They wanted to, to kill him. And they tried every way they could think of. One day, a, a group of Pharisees engaged the services of a lawyer to approach Jesus and ask him a question that was absolutely not answerable. The, the, the lawyer approached Jesus and said, Good teacher, what is the greatest commandment? I mean, within the religious tradition, there were 613 commandments. 248 were posed in a positive frame. Thou shalt do this. 248. 365 were posed in a negative frame. Thou shalt not do this. This wasn't of God. This was a human construct. In fact, the number 248 corresponded to what people considered the known parts of a human body in that day and time. The 365 was, of course, the number of days in the year. I mean, the Pharisees couldn't follow the law. They spent so much time trying to keep up with the law, trying to interpret it, trying to, to not fail the law, that, that it was like they were in quicksand, a tepid water, stagnant. Nothing could move. And so... And so they had this attorney approach Jesus. What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, in one fell swoop, transformed that environment forever. His answer is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the, the 22nd chapter, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said to the lawyer, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In order for that wave, that tsunami of love that Jesus began 2,000 years ago to continue, we've got to keep it simple, folks. We've got to be 
more fluid. We've got to move with greater ease and openness and, and, and willingness. I mean, what if, what, what if love God, love neighbor is to become our church's mission statement? Love God, love neighbor. Everyone can remember it. What if it became our mantra? What if our hearts, our souls, our minds were totally devoted to simply fulfilling Jesus' command to love God and love neighbor? What if our United Methodist vows were, were focused on this? Our, our, our prayers were given over to loving God and loving neighbor. Our presence, our coming together was the, for the purpose of going out again and, and reaching out to our neighbors and to God. Our gifts, our financial gifts, what if they weren't given with stinginess but with openness and love because we were a transforming community? Our service, our hands-on giving to God, what if it was focused on loving God and loving neighbor and, of course, our witness, everything that we do? What if all of these were focused on simply loving God and loving neighbor? How might the church's ripple effect be experienced in a powerful way? Do you know, do you know that today, October 30th, 2011, you know that today, 27,000 tons of food, 27,000 tons of food will be donated worldwide to relieve global hunger. 27,000 tons this day, October 30th alone, to alleviate world hunger. I mean, it sounds terribly generous, doesn't it? That is, until you realize that today, in the United States of America, we will waste 132,000 tons of food down the garbage disposal in the trash. And so as you leave here today, I want to invite you to do something. As you sit down to your plate of food at, at lunch today, that nicely prepared meal, I want to invite you, challenge you to pause and to give thanks for that food that God has given you. And then, and then to consider how might this moment for me become a ripple that leads to a wave that creates a tsunami that transforms the world that reaches out to our neighbors in God's name to provide a world where all are loved. Amen. Would you please stand and sing our last song? stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing
the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall When with the ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see It will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me stand amazed I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner So I invite you to go out of here and go feed the hungry and go clothe the naked and go visit people who are in prison, give a drink of water to the thirsty, something to eat to the hungry, exercise your right to vote in a free community, get involved with your neighborhood associated association, mentor a child, get involved in tutoring in public schools, do something with your life that creates a ripple that transforms the world for Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful.